So we come to the next session. And uh, as we know, uh, in cancer, IV access is very important. And uh, we have been using it regularly for IV and uh, blood transfusions and sample collections and all and chemotherapeutic agents that we push in the patient by IV access. And if there's an extravasation of these drugs, chemicals or chemotherapeutic agents, there's a disaster that happens at the local tissue. The tissue damage is there, ulceration is there. For that, now we have uh, a speaker, Mrs. Lori Bessel from USA. She is an executive director, Center for Global Cancer Medicine, Dana Faber Cancer Institute, Boston, USA. And she's going to tell us and speak us about the extravasation, how to prevent, and what is the treatment if it has happened. So may I ask Mrs. Lori Bessel to start the presentation, please. Uh, thank you very much and good afternoon to everybody. Um, I am going to just share my screen. Can everybody see my screen? Yes, sir. Okay, um, so thank you very much for this opportunity um, to talk to you about extravasation, um, which is clearly sits within the nursing domain of um, practice. Uh, and what I hope to cover today is really understanding the responsibilities of nurses in preparation and administration of vesicant chemotherapy drugs and to provide um, the nurses here with information regarding prevention and management of vesicant um, extravasations. And I wanna just say that um, prevention is the best thing that you can do because if you do have an extravasation, they are very, very difficult to manage. Um, so <clears throat> I, I wanted to just start with a, um, with a definition of what a vesicant extravasation is. And, and so it is a leakage of certain drugs called vesicants out of the vein into the tissues around the vein. And vesicants can cause blistering and other tissue injury that may be severe and can lead to tissue necrosis or tissue death. The vesicant chemotherapy drugs that we typically use in oncology are either DNA binding drugs or, or non-DNA binding drugs. And I will only say that um, the DNA binding drugs um, produce a much more severe reaction in the skin than the non-DNA binding drugs and management of them is a little bit different. And so these are things like um, nitrogen mustard, which we don't see used that much in the United States anymore. I don't know if you use it as part of a mop chemotherapy for Hodgkin's disease. Um, we tend not to use nitrogen mustard, but the anthracyclines like doxorubicin, donorubicin, epirubicin, um, idorubicin, dactinomycin, mitomycin C are all very frequently used drugs as are the taxanes and um, plant alkaloids like vincristine, vinblastine, um, vinrelabine. Um, so these are the drugs that we're talking about when we talk about vesicants and all nurses should be acutely aware of what are vesicants and what are uh, irritants. And so I just wanna say a couple words about irritants. So there are a lot of chemotherapy drugs that are classified as irritants and they cause inflammation in the vein wall. They usually don't cause tissue damage unless there is a large amount of one of these drugs that has extravasated. Um, but again, if a patient is getting carboplatinum or decarbazine, decarbazine is particularly irritating, um, and they complain of pain or burning at the site, you want to pull that IV and start another IV in another arm, uh, in the other arm or higher up in the, in the um, patient's arm. So one of the first things that nurses 
um, really need to do when they administer chemotherapy, uh, particularly that include vesicants, is they need to be aware of the patient. So as part of their patient assessment, they need to understand whether or not the patient is at risk for developing an extravasation. And the patient risk factors are um, patients that have altered sensory perception. So, you know, they have, they can't feel pain the, the way that they normally would in, in, in one of their arms, or they have peripheral vascular disease. So they have compromised circulatory system. Um, I don't know if you use implanted porticasts, but those are a disc uh, in the chest usually with a tube attached. Um, an implanted port is a central venous access device, which are great when they work well. Um, and if they are deeply implanted and you have to go through a lot of subcutaneous tissue in order to access that porticath, that patient would be at risk for an extravasation. Um, exposure to non-chemotherapy irritating agents like potassium. So, you know, a lot of patients that, um, that get cisplatinum as part of their, their chemotherapy, um, they tend to get a lot of potassium replacement and that's irritating to veins. Patients that have repeated peripheral chemotherapy administration and, or multiple venipunctures um, are particularly um, at high risk. If a patient has impaired communication skills or cognition and, and might not be able to understand the signs and symptoms that you want them to tell you about, um, or they can't communicate with you, um, those are patients that are ri at risk for extravasation. Highly mobile and active patients. So if you're treating somebody and they're you know, up and around and you know, doing exercises in their room, um, those patients are at risk. Um, patients with um, uh, poor education or poor understanding of information um, are at risk. Patients with lymphedema, so anybody who has an, had an axillary node dissection, uh, we tend to stay away from extremities with lymphedema. Um, you know, so you would want to avoid those extremities. Pediatric and geriatric patients are at higher risk. Um, poor or no blood return from an IV site or a venous access device. If you don't have a blood return, those devices should not be used unless in the case of a venous access device, a central venous access, you get a dye study to confirm patency and placement. Patients that have poor venous access, if a patient comes in you know, once every two or three weeks for chemotherapy and it takes five tries to get an IV in that patient, that's a patient that you as a nurse would want to highly advocate that they get a central venous catheter, central line access. Um, it's just, it's not fair to the patient. It's not fair to put them at risk. Patients that are obese and you're using uh, peripheral, IV, uh, peripheral IVs to give your chemotherapy and they have deep veins, those patients are also at risk, as well as uh, patients that have small or fragile veins. And we often see this in elderly patients. Um, and then obviously treatment duration, the longer somebody is on chemotherapy treatment, the higher risk they are uh, for extravasation. So really important as a nurse, when you meet a patient that is going to be getting a vesicant, you know, say it's ABVD and um, the doxorubicin and the vinblastine are vesicants and the, and the um, decarbazine is a, high, is a highly irritant. And if they come in and on the first week you have trouble getting an IV in them, that's when you want to call the doctor and say, look, they need 11 more of these treatments and I, I, we're not going to be able to get their treatment. So um, central venous access devices are very good for patients who are going to get a lot of vesicant treatment. There are also some nurse-related risk factors, and those include somebody who is has extensive experience with vesicants and begins to be overconfident in their ability to, to give it. Sometimes um, their overconfidence 
leads them um, to have extravasations. Failure to identify patients at risk. So all those factors that we just went over, you know, if a nurse doesn't do a good ex, um, assessment and, um, you know, misses some of those risk factors, you know, that that's really a nursing responsibility. Um, improper venipuncture technique, improper vesicant administration technique, inexperience with giving vesicants. You know, not even knowing what the vesicants are is a risk factor. You know, so nurses need to be well educated, oriented. Um, if uh, a vesicant administration is interrupted because the nurse has, you know, six other patients and somebody's vomiting and she has to leave the bedside giving a vesicant to tend to somebody else, um, the IV site selection. So we never want to choose um, the dorsum of the hand or the wrist area or the antecubital area for our, our IV when we are giving a vesicant. Lack of time and lack of training have also been identified as risk factors related to the nurse. There are also device and drug related risk factors. Um, so device factors can be improper um, port needle placement. So again, when somebody has a port -a cap that disc in their chest and they put, there's a special needle you use to put into the septum of the port. If that is not placed properly, if it is, um, you know, sitting in the skin, but hasn't uh, penetrated the septum, then you would be giving drug right into the subcutaneous space. Migration of the catheter trip of a ven uh, catheter tip of the venous access device, pinch off syndrome of a venous access device. So that's when the um, catheter goes between the clavicle and the first rib and gets pinched off and can cause um, a tear in in the catheter. And then using a venous access device without a blood return. And then the drug factors are concentration. So if something's highly concentrated and gets extravasated, then you are going to have a, a bad extravasation as opposed to if something is more dilute. The duration of the infusion, so longer infusions, uh, higher risk. The root uh, infusion versus push, and, and I'll talk about the different ways of giving vesicants. Um, and then vesicant properties. So remember I told you that the DNA binding vesicants are uh, more severe than the non-DNA binding uh, vesicants, and then the volume of the diluent. So the more dilu diluent you have, um, the less chance of having a bad extravasation. Um, so when nurses um, are giving um, vesicants and, uh, and if they have an extravasation, usually, um, the patient will have some pain and they would describe it as a burning or a stinging or a sensation of coolness around the administration site. Um, some patients may not experience pain at all. Um, and, and therefore, you know, it, pain can't be the only thing that you rely on. Um, sometimes there will also be some erythema in the area. Um, but often there is swelling in the area. So if the IV catheter has come out of the vein and you're dripping or pushing a vesicant, you will see that infiltration rate at the site. And so you want to make sure that, um, that you can see the IV site very, very well. So you can keep your eye on it as that, that um, either IV infusion or your push is going in. Um, sometimes Swelling is a little hard to tell if you have an implanted port because again, it's in the subcutaneous tissue um, of the chest wall. Um, <clears throat> and then obviously one of the, the biggest signs and symptoms is loss of a blood return um, from an IV when you are giving a vesicant. And if you lose a blood return, if a patient complains of pain, if you see swelling, um, you know, then those are all signs of uh, 
of an extravasation and you you want to stop and and I'll talk about the procedure for that in a minute. Um, and then the other sign is if you are giving it through an infusion, another sign of an extravasation is if the infusion be begins to drip really slow, much slower than what it had been dripping, or if it stops completely, um, then that's an indication that it may have been an extravasation. Um, what we tend to see later on is, um, you know, so these are delayed signs and symptoms. So in the area where the extravasation occurred, um, you will um, you will see ulcerations and, and if they're not treated with an antidote. And I'm gonna talk about um, the antidotes in a few minutes, but you'll see blistering of the skin, discoloration of the skin in duration. And that usually begins around one to two weeks after, after the suspected extravasation. So you need to be, you need to instruct your patient about those things. Um, then the skin will start to peel and begin to slough off. And then um, you'll see tissue necrosis. And sometimes the tissue necrosis requires surgical debridement and skin grafting or a flap replacement. Pain usually increases in intensity over that time period. Um, sometimes there can be damage to underlying tendons and nerve causing uh, sensory impairment and permanent damage um, that can result in severe disability and discomfort. And sometimes that um, nerve damage, uh, uh, permanent nerve damage or um, a limb might need to be amputated depending on the extent of the extravasation and damage. And so I want to uh, just switch a minute to um, show you um, hmm. I want to, oh, I want to just switch. I want to show you some extravasation pictures. Um, and I don't have permission to use these, therefore, they're not in my talk. Um, so you won't get these, but I want to show these to you. So, this is a chest of a woman who had a porta calf. And um, this was uh, a a week or so after she had an extravasation. So the date of this was February 14th, okay? And this is what it looked like. So you can see the redness um, of the area. Um, and then you can see 14 days later, the area is uh, much more red, beginning to blister and peel. And then what you see is on March 18th, so you know about three weeks later, that site had to have surgical debridement. Um, and then you can see uh, June 5th, so now several months later, um, it, granulation tissue forming around that and beginning to heal. And then you see um, in December, so remember the first, um, the extravasation happened in February, so 10 months after the extravasation, the area is healed, but you can see um, the damage that this has caused um, in her subcutaneous tissue and skin. Um, and then this is just a picture of um, severe tissue necrosis after vesicant extravasation in a wrist. And, you know, this, this is what can happen um, in an extravasation. And, you know, if you've never seen one of these, and, and quite honestly, I, I've never seen one of these in my career, um, but these are pretty devastating. So you want to do everything that you can do to prevent, um, to prevent an extravasation from occurring and don't rely on, oh, we, you know, if it happens, we can manage it, you know, like nausea and vomiting. And extravasation is a pretty significant, um, is a pretty significant event. Um, so in terms of preventing extravasation at the patient care level, you want to educate your patient about signs and symptoms of an extravasation so that they know to tell you if they feel pain or burning or, or even something funny about the site um, 
You want to avoid extremities with impaired circulation and lymphedema. You don't want to use the hand, wrist, or the antecubital space. Um, you want to advocate for venous access devices for patients that are going to get long-term administration, have poor venous access, or for pediatric, um, pediatric patients and elderly patients. When you're giving the Vescant, you want to make sure that you can um, clearly visualize the IV site throughout the infusion. You want to inspect the IV site or the venous access device during the infusion for redness or swelling. You wanna ask and instruct, you wanna actively ask the patient, is it feeling okay? You know, do you have any pain or burning? And you also want to make sure that you've told them to report any pain or burning at the IV site. And you want to um, maintain a free flowing IV to dilute an IV push or a piggyback vesicant. So if you give it through infusion, um, you want to have um, I, an IV going so that um, it dilutes the vesicant. Um, you also want to make sure that you maintain a good blood return throughout the vesicant administration. Um, if you do have a venous access device and it does not have a good blood return, you can push fluids through it, fluids drip well through it, but you can't get a blood return. You should not use that until you get a dye study that confirms that the line is patent and the tip of the catheter is in the correct place. Um, if you are giving um, the vesicant through a peripheral IV, you wanna make sure that you are using a good large vein, typically in the forearm are where those, you will find those veins. You always want to use a relatively new IV. So if you're if your eye if you, if a patient is in the hospital um, for a couple of days and they're due for a vesicant, if that IV is older than a day old, you want to start a new IV. Um, you want to make sure that the IV site or your port needle going into a central venous access device that they are well secured, so that there is not a chance of patient getting up to go to the bathroom and all of a sudden they forget to push their IV pole and the, the um, needle or the catheter dislodges and now the vesicant is going into their, um, into their subcutaneous space. The other thing that I didn't put on, on, this, um, on this talk and I can add it and then send it to whoever can distribute it to you all is if a patient comes in and they are going to get their vesicant through a peripheral IV and you um, and, and they have poor access, but it's a patient that has symptoms and they need to be treated right away. And there's gonna be a central line put in at some point, but you have to use a peripheral IV. <clears throat> when you're looking for an IV site, you really should start low on the patient's forearm to put an IV in, because if you are unsuccessful, you want to move up um, more proximal, like higher up in the arm to get the, to try the next IV so that when you are successful and you're putting the vesicant in and, it's, and, and it goes into the veins and it's be, being returned um, into the core of the body, that that vesicant um, isn't, leaking out of other veins that you have attempted to put an IV in. And we see that. So if you start high up in the, in the forearm and you, you know, you get into the vein, but you've punctured the vein and, and that you've blown the vein and you move lower down. And if you are in that same vein, there is a chance that that IV, that that vesicant is going to travel up and then leak out at that prior site. And the same is true. Um, you want to, you, you know, at where I work, a lot of patients come in and have their blood counts checked through an antecubital stick, and then they go to the nurses for their um, to get their chemotherapy. And if they have had an antecubital um, venipuncture for blood, 
and we give a vesicant below that site, there is a chance that that vesicant will leak out at that antecubital venipuncture site and cause an extravasation there. So you want to avoid that situation. Um, at the institute level, in terms of, um, so for all of the administrators and leaders on this call, there are, are things at the institute level that you can do to help prevent extravasations from occurring. And those are things like making sure that when you hire new nurses to work in your oncology unit, that there is a training course for them if they have never worked in oncology before. And even if they have, um, you wanna make sure that they know your policies and procedures and standard operating procedures for giving vesicants and, and everything else included in being an oncology nurse. So making sure that there is training and that it includes the proper um, vesicant administration technique. And that's not just telling them what it is and then expecting that they can do it, but it should include clinical competency observation so that somebody who is teaching them is sitting right beside them, um, giving vesicants and instructing them and um, telling them what to do as they're doing it. And it, it can even include practicing um, on um, companies make these ar fake arms where you can put an IV in and you can start the IV and you can get practice pushing drugs so that you you know, it's a manual dexterity um, skill also in handling the syringe and the IV and checking for a blood return. So you can even um, institute something like that um, in like a simulation lab to train new nurses. You should have um, an approved standard operating procedure for vesicant administration that outlines step by step what it what the proper technique is. And then even after you have trained nurses, um, you can institute an annual competency um, observation to, to validate that your nursing practice hasn't degraded in any way over time. And then the other thing that is really important is to monitor extravasation rates for potential spikes in your numbers. And the way that you would do this is um, you would ask help from pharmacy to let them know in a given month how many vesicants were dispensed from the pharmacy. And then you would want to have a system that all extravasations that occur are reported. Um, and I'm going to talk about this in a minute uh, when I talk about documentation, but you may want to consider having a special form that gets filled out if a uh, extravasation, if a suspected extravasation occurs, and you can use those forms, those reports, as a way to monitor what your extravasation rate is. And you know, some extravasations, quite honestly, are very hard to prevent. Um, you know, if there's a venous access device malfunction, like in the case of the picture that I showed you, that was a case where um, there was a, a leak in the catheter and nobody could have seen that. A nurse could not have prevented that. Um, but you would want to monitor the rates and make sure that they stay at a very low level. And, and again, you know, the, these are institutional leadership administration level um, things that can be done to prevent extravasations. So, so if you, if the nurse is going to give um, a vesicant by a peripheral IV, you would never want to use a pump because pumps put pressure on the vein. So you just want to use a free flowing IV. You want to stay with the, the patient the um, entire time if you are giving it over a short infusion. And short infusions should not be any longer than 30 to 60 minutes. Um, when, um, so, you, so the only way you want to give a vesicant is through either IV push or a short infusion through a peripheral IV. Um, when you are giving the vesicant, either way, you want to verify, verify a blood return every two to five milliliters for an IV push. 
um, and every 10, five to 10 minutes if it's a short infusion. And again, you wanna stay there and you wanna monitor um, closely for any signs and symptoms of an extravasation. Um, vesicants through a central venous access device, you can either push those you know, with a, with a syringe, um, you can either give it as a short infusion over 30 to 60 minutes um, or as a continuous infusion. And there are several uh, protocols for diseases that we treat like sarcoma um, or um, multiple myeloma that require vesicants to be given over a continuous infusion. Um, you want, again, to verify, verify your blood re return before, during, and after. Um, you want to monitor the site throughout the infusion according to your institutional policy. You know, at my hospital, we check if somebody has a continuous infusion, we check the blood return two times a shift, and we have um, three shifts a, in a 24-hour period, so that gets checked six times in 24 hours. And then again, if there is any sign or symptom of an extravasation, you discontinue the vesicant administration. So if you're going to give the vesicant through with an IV push method, there are two different ways of giving an IV push vesicant. There's a direct push method. And what this is, is you have an IV, you verify that you have a blood return, you have a, a syringe with saline flush, you flush it, you detach the syringe and you attach the syringe with the drug in it. And then you would push the drug directly into the IV catheter. You would push it slowly. You would aspirate for a blood return every two to five mLs. Once it is, you're done pushing the entire drug, you would discontinue the drug syringe you would attach a flush syringe, you would flush it through, and then after you flush it, you would either cap the IV site or discontinue the drug. The um, disadvantage with this method is that you potentially, um, when you're done pushing the vesicant and you discontinue, you potentially could have um, a drop or two of blood under the IV site, which would contain chemotherapy, which as you all know, is a hazardous drug. And so there would be some, um, you know, chemotherapy exposure in this case. The other method, which is the method that we use at the hospital where I work and how I was taught is IV pit push through a free flow method. And this also is called like a side arm technique. And so you would have a running IV into the patient, a normal saline or compatible solution, depending on what your drug is. And you would have that, you know, dripping in at a slow rate. You would um, attach the syringe at, the, at a Y site closest to the patient. You would aspirate to verify that you have a blood return. And then you would um, allow the IV solution to um, flow freely. And then you slowly administer the chemotherapy agent as a push, allowing the IV solution to dilute the drug. You administer that at a rate of about one to two mLs per minute, unless there is a, um, an, another indication. Um, <clears throat> if you are giving something like CHOP chemotherapy, where you have doxorubicin and vincristine, you want to make sure that you flush the line in between those two chemotherapy drugs and that you flush the line um, that you check for a blood return and you flush the line after you're done. Um, you know, as you might imagine, um, giving vesicants is a much more timely activity for nurses, a time consuming activity for nurses than it is to simply hang a bag of cyclophosphamide and let it drip in and the nurse can go about um, other activities. Um, so having, having enough nurses and them having the time to give vesicants is really important. Um, I talked a little bit about uh, continuous infusion vesicants and 
I just want to say again that central venous access device um, administration is highly preferred, um, much lower chance of an extravasation happening with a central venous access device than with a peripheral IV. Um, and, and so when this happens, you want to check the blood return and IV patency according to the institutional policy. And this is where I said that at my institution that happens um, six times in a 24 hour period. You would connect the IV, um, the drug directly to the IV access device or piggyback it into um, a main line. If you do do a piggyback, you want to make sure that all of the lines are very secure with lure locks um, or a similar device. Thank you, yeah, I uh, uh, want to interrupt you because we are behind uh, now. So okay, I'm sorry. To conclude, please. Um, yep. Yeah, so let me just say um, uh, that I will go really quickly. If an extravasation happens, you want to stop the infusion immediately. You do not want to flush the line. You want to discontinue, dis, um, disconnect the tubing, and you want to take a syringe and aspirate as much of the agent as possible from the existing access device, and then remove that catheter or port needle. You want to then notify the provider of, an, of the possible extravasation. You, with the provider, um, you can determine if an antidote can be administered. Um, you want to measure and document the area, and if possible, take pictures of it with a date and time. You want to, depending on the agent, you want to apply warm or cold compresses for 15 minutes every four hours for the first couple of days. For the plant alkaloids, you want to use warm packs for alkylating agents, anthracyclines, and antibiotics. You want to use cold packs. Elevate the extremity. Document the event in detail. What size catheter, where it was, when it happened, how many cc's you think extravasated. Um, take pictures. And again, this is where I think a special form might be helpful. Um, that patient should come back 24 hours later, 48 hours later, one week, and you should have follow-up at least through three weeks, take pictures. And you may need to refer to a surgeon, physical therapy, pain management, rehab um, for evaluation. Um, if you do have an extravasation, there are antidotes for alkylating agents, anthracyclines, and plant alkaloids. There is no antidote for anti-tumor antibiotics, um, and that's it. Uh, thank you very much for a very nice presentation, and I'll uh, congratulate you for giving us the practical tips uh, for evaluation and management of extravasation of chemotherapeutic drugs. Thank you very much, Dr.